So let's move on then to the, the more recent approval of gilteritinib uh, for patients with relapse refractory acute myeloid leukemia with either a FLT3 ITD or TKD. So Sasha, I know you've been very much involved in the development of gilteritinib. Why don't you bring us up to date on that? Uh, well, the biggest update on gilteritinib is it's now approved. Um, it was approved based on uh, interim analysis from a phase three study, the final data of which are not yet publicly available. We hope to have that soon. Uh, but the response rate on that study showed that the drug has activity in a very hard to treat population uh, that has a very low response rate to salvage chemotherapy. Uh, and the expected response to chemotherapy was really quite abysmal. So improving that bar, even a small amount, could be a big gain ultimately in terms of the submarinable readout, which we'll see soon when the data are back from that study. Um, so this is an active agent. And what's notable about the approval is it's based off of CR and CRH. It's not based off of CRI or some modification of CRI or anything that was cooked up to make a FLT3 inhibitor look active in this setting with modifications for what could be even toxicity of the drug. These are the agreed upon uh, standard uh, definitions for all agents being looked at the FDA right now. Um, and it's only 21%, but it is actually in this population uh, a reasonable response rate for what's, again, going to be associated with a good quality of life outpatient, but, but et cetera. Let me ask you before you go on about that. We also had the response um, to the less intensive and more intensive therapy. Why wasn't that in the label? So a clinician can look at the label yeah, and say, hey, 21% yeah. doesn't sound so great, but look what it was with chemo. Mm -hmm. Why wasn't it there? What I can say is stay tuned. I didn't come up with the <laughs> statistical analysis plan of this study, which had to do with a, a interim analysis to meet a pre-specified endpoint for the trial. There are actually interim analyses of survival on the study as well, and a final analysis for survival on the study as well. We'll have all the data soon. We we had hoped to have everything here for ASH, but the timing doesn't always work out. You know, remember the Lestortinib study? I, that's when I first hit me in the face that in FLT3 relapsed AML, that the response to chemotherapy, we used it MEC and HIDAC. Fall off yeah. a cliff yeah, bad. It was, it was like yes. 20%. It was, it was just as low, and now you're talking yeah. about an outpatient oral therapy. Right. Uh, once a day, you take your pill, and in general, these patients play pretty well on this, on this drug. It's got very limited toxicity. It's not to say there's no toxicity. You certainly see cytopenias with this drug. You do see LFT abnormalities. Uh, the label recommends monitoring QT, although I have to say it, it, there's very minimal QT effect that I have seen personally, and I can only think of rare patients that we've ever had to make dose modifications based on QT. So it's going to be developed in addition with chemotherapy backbone. Yeah, so the exciting thing about it is, uh, you know, once we saw it was active in the relapse refractory setting, right away we went to say, how can we use this in frontline patients? Because nobody wants to treat relapsed AML, you want to prevent relapses. So uh, data on the frontline approach, which uh, in which we added a 14-day treatment with gilteritinib to induction chemotherapy, consolidation chemotherapy, and then maintenance, and patients who went on to transplant could get maintenance with the drug afterwards. Uh, were presented. Uh, now on this study, this is a phase one study to look at what's the optimal dose and a little bit what's the optimal anthracycline and schedule. So there were patients who were FLT3 wild type, patients who were FLT3 mutated, but we have a lot more data on the FLT3 mutated patients from this study, although most of it is response data. We don't have a lot of survival data, or relapse rates or things like that, which I would really like to, you know, get further analysis on and get you know, those data out there so we can start getting a sense of how does this stack up to data that we know. But the response rate is extremely high and virtually all patients responded with one cycle. And that was really different from what we saw on Ratify. And when I say really high, I think the, the combined CR rates for CR, CRI, uh, CRP were 93% plus. Um, so that is a, granted a Small phase two setting. That was exactly and it, the very data similar to the data we saw. Yeah, I was you know, thinking the same. Ago. Phase one B of my phase story. Two, three. However, but, yeah. the, the question is going to be answered because yeah. they're already launching the, the randomized study against yeah. Midas yeah. Turn. And you and stole this, my thunder. Oh, okay. I was going to say that the next thing to do yeah. is obviously you rewind, got rewind. Rewind. It wasn't hard to do it, <laughs> and we need this in a randomized okay, study. Okay, Don Roops in 90 or 60 in the study. Depends. Actually, I think it depends where you're studying it. In okay. the U.S., it's going just, to be just like you said. And in Europe, it's okay. going to be 60. And right. the schedule was days four Two studies. There's going to be a U.S. study. There's going to be a European study. It's malpractice study. if you don't give anthracycline X. Okay, so, you know, remember the Mitostorin study was based on some preclinical data, actually from you, I think, uh, about the sequence of a FLT3 inhibitor after being given, <sighs> best given after yes. chemotherapy. But in this study, I'm just, I, I, I know, history's a 
is tough to deal with. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, but in this study, it stays four through seventeen. Is that right? Or we 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 wrote the regimen. Uh, it actually initially was it was concurrent, and that wasn't well tolerated. We quickly moved to move the the plat three inhibitor after the donorubicin right. was or actually the, after the idorubicin was done. That was four to seventeen, mm -hmm. and then we've matched it to what's done on ratify, so eight to twenty. Oh, so it's going to be offer some direct comment. insight into this. Yes, yes the, there is a there is data suggesting sequencing where the preclinical data said if you give your FLT3 inhibitor during or after chemotherapy was synergistic, if you gave it well before, it was actually would put cells into cell cycle arrest and they wouldn't respond to chemo. So the designers of the ratified trial sort of interpreted this not the way I would have. They said, we have to do it after. And I said, no, I, you can actually do it during. In fact, it kind of makes more sense, but you have to avoid the anthracycline. And so we, we thought they would do start on day four, and instead they started on day eight. Part of that was just tolerability. They yeah. tried on day four, and, and patients yeah. Yeah. couldn't tolerate it. But giltritinib, because you can take giltritinib and not know, it's the same as placebo, you will not know you're taking yeah. it, you can take that on day four. And so that allows us to go back in history and say, no, that was the way we wanted to do it originally. However, uh, to imitate ratify, there is this push to do it on day eight for reasons that I would point out are flawed because ratify was doing it wrong in the first place. If they could have, they would have wanted to do it on day four if they could, and they tried, as you as you, as you And it may affect you know, interpretation of nature. Maris, it makes certain things a little bit challenging. Sure. You know, one of the things in the approved indication for giltritinib, I think is very important, is that there is actually a randomized study that shows CR response rates in FLT3 mutated relapse, which is a quantum. And of course, these are different studies, but I was shocked to see the CR rate was one percent, and I think the CRCRI even together is 23, 24, and that's CRI. Yeah. So I think even though we don't know, and we hopefully will know, I think a CRCRH with a single agent is good, and, and I think we're a little bit spoiled in AML. You know, all the excitement with PD-1 inhibitors and solid tumors, what's the response rate? 15 percent, 18 percent, lung cancer. Now, of course, you combine them, and that's what we should do. So we showed some data with quizartinib, uh, ASA with quizartinib versus quiz alone. And in salvage setting, we're seeing the response rates are higher and the survival, which I don't think anybody's surprised. It was just we had to do it, we did it. But you know, you go from the six month to 12, 14 months. So I think we need these tools, they're out there. Now the real research begins. How do you combine them? How do you sequence them? You know? And how about the quality of the remissions with giltritinib? You presented data on MRD uh, in the relapse refractory setting. So those actually were kind of surprising. And again, I think this does, uh, giltritinib is unique. It does not inhibit CKIT. You don't get the myelosuppression, so you don't get the requirement for transfusions. Uh, and when we applied a, a novel assay combining PCR next generation sequencing, one which actually is available, you can order it, um, uh, that assay identified uh, patients who were who had a remission and were MRD negative, and lo and behold, they lived a lot longer than the patients who had remissions who were MRD positive. And furthermore, the quality of response, a CRCRH, had a higher rate of being MRD negative than the other responses. So everything goes together. We're going to use MRD to actually kind of characterize these funny responses. So some people, you know, would consider anything that has a subscript after CR as being a less important CR. What did you notice about MRD with CRH? So the MRD was, in fact, I would actually sort of agree with that. CRH is very close to a CR. It, it really is. Yes. Again, you can go to the Bahamas That's with right. a CRH. Okay. So CRB, so CRB, CRB, <laughs> Uh, yeah, Gail Robos had the swimmer's plot, and she said, these patients are swimming to the Bahamas because <laughs> they've got a CRH. Uh, no, it, that was actually fairly reassuring to see the combination CRCRH had such a high MRD negative rate. Uh, and so, no, I think when we say a CRH, the MRD reassures us in that regards. But I do think we have to be careful calling C, uh, MRD negativity in a, in, a, in a drug that works very differently than cytotoxic right. chemotherapy because sure. we're looking for a mutation. We're not looking for flow evidence of a leukemia cell. And there were patients who actually didn't meet criteria for CR who yet were MRD negative. Now, what's going on in that marrow? Is that clonal rearrangement for cells that don't have a FLT3 mutation? 
I think that takes further in, study. In those cases, I think you, we, we cleared the FLT3 clone and the rest of the chemo is here. Right, and presumably yeah. that's more indolent. Uh, and and that's, that where the, that's where the combinations okay. maybe, yeah. you know. Yeah. Absolutely But I right. think for a community, I think you're right. The MRD is nice, but, I, you know, they, they say, what are you going to do with IDH and FLT3? If the MRD is negative, I high five the patient, nothing else, because everything else yeah. goes on. You treat them the same. You don't stop treatment. You don't intensify treatment. So it's nice, makes you feel good, but today we don't change any treatment. We will know with MRD with the result of randomized trials that are ongoing now, though. Could you I stop? Think, I think we're going to get an answer. Yeah. Uh, not just uh, could we stop. We're checking MRD at multiple stages, diagnosis all the way out to maintenance to, to really find out with a good assay. Now, this only applies to FLT3. We really need to do this sort of thing for all of the, yeah, you know, we need to expand it to, to the rest of AML.